Hi, everybody. This is funny. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm here to tell, uh, tell you about Python at NERSC. Um, my name is Lori Steffi. I'm in the Data and Anal Analytics Services group. Um, and if you uh, have any trouble with Python and submit Python tickets, uh, they'll come to me. So my uh, goal here is to help you use Python um, as well as you can without needing my help. <laughs> All right, so uh, for most of you, I probably don't need to tell you about Python. Um, many of you, I imagine, are probably Python users. Uh, if we were in a real life setting, I would ask for a show of hands, but unfortunately, can't do that. Um, I think this XKCD comic uh, captures what I like, and I think what a lot of people really like about Python. Um, it's clean, uh, it's, it's easy to get started, and instead of focusing on array syntax, you can focus on your science problem. Um, so for that reason, Python's popular, it's growing. Um, I'm gonna talk to you today about kind of standard Python. Um, I won't cover any of the machine learning uh, parts of the Python ecosystem, but uh, Mustafa will cover that, I think, in today's uh, last talk. All right, so, can you use Python at NERSC? Yes. Um, although this is uh, sort of a recent phenomenon, maybe in about uh, 10 years ago, um, using Python was not really a given. Um, languages like C and Fortran were dominant, but um, fortunately times have changed. So uh, now I'm sure you've heard we have um, over 7,000 users. A lot of these users use Python for at least some part of their work. Um, and this number is growing. So I think this is great. Um, we are here to help you with Python at NERSC. It's a first class citizen. It's fully supported. Um, there are several ways uh, that we could provide Python, but our current per, uh, preferred way is Anaconda Python. Um, I'll talk more about the details, but uh, we give you the ability to either use our pre-built environment or to build your own. So you can kind of choose your own adventure. Um, I'll just reiterate that we're here to help. We're very friendly. Um, if you have uh, questions or run into any issues uh, with Python, um, we're here to help you get done what you need to get done. And uh, my last point is to get started using Python. Uh, all you need to do is module load Python. So I uh, hope that's straightforward enough. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are kind of two major ways uh, we encourage people to use Python at NERSC. Um, there is a pre-built Python where we have done the work for you to assemble this environment. So this is like our prefabricated house here. Um, and that's great if you're just trying to do something straightforward, um, if you're not trying to use any custom libraries. So you can be off uh, doing what you need to do. If you need to install um, something that your domain uses, like a custom package, um, just anything that's not in the base environment uh, are solutions that you will build your own custom con environment. Uh, so that's, that's the house under construction here. So uh, that's easy to do. Uh, these are about the five lines of code you need if you would like to build your own environment. Of course, don't forget module load Python. Um, if you don't, you're gonna end up with user bin Python, which is kind of old crusty Python. It's not, <laughs> not really up to date, doesn't really have good packages. So always, always module load Python. Um, you can create uh, whatever environment you like. Um, once you are inside your environment, which is what source activate uh, does for you, you are the king or queen uh, of your environment. You can conda or pip install anything you like. So um, do, do what you like, import anti-gravity. Uh, when you're done, uh, you can deactivate. So that's it. Um, I, I really like this. I do this all the time. Um, it's easy to convert one of these custom environments into a uh, Jupyter kernel, uh, if you like Jupyter. And if something goes wrong, um, no problem. Just delete your environment and start again. Because it's so easy to make your environment, it's probably quicker to build a new one than to try to troubleshoot what went wrong in your old environment. So that's all there is to it. OK. Um, so since you're here at NERSC, uh, you're probably interested in how you can run your Python uh, at some scale uh, bigger than your laptop. Um, that is a complex question, uh, but I just want to give you an overview of the landscape. You have um, several options, and it kind of depends on how big you need to go. If uh, your job 
fits on a single node uh, and you don't care about scaling up past that, I would say multiprocessing is probably the best solution for you. Um, it's easy to use. Uh, they, your um, workers can share memory, so great. If you have um, dreams that are bigger than a single node, uh, you can scale up using Dask uh, or MPI for Pi. Uh, I know there were some questions uh, earlier in the notes about Dask. I can't talk about it in a lot of detail because I don't have time. Um, but Dask is a kind of a cool way um, that you can parallelize your work in Python by having a scheduler um, and maybe some number of workers, say a thousand workers. And then you, as the programmer, split your job up into pieces that you hand uh, to workers. And so that's kind of how Dask works. Um, right now, we recommend you use Dask via Jupyter. And uh, when you do that, you can see lots of really nice um, tools that let you visualize what is happening in your job. I think that's my favorite part about Dask. Um, yeah, if you have more information, or if, you, if you'd like to know more about Dask, uh, submit a ticket and we can help you. Um, Okay, the other option for scaling your code uh, is the tried and true MPI. Um, MPI for Pi is kind of a nice uh, Python interface to MPI, and it lets you run as big as the whole machine, if that's what you need to do. Um, with the major caveat that if you're using MPI for Pi, you should also very seriously consider using a container. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this. But at really large scale, your performance will get slow um, because of file system traffic. So uh, MPI should, all, should be kind of synonymous in your head uh, with Docker and Shifter. So um, check, check out our docs for, for more information on that. OK, so <laughs> part of my job here today is to help you get um, running on Cori with Python and to help you avoid common problems. Uh, life's better for all of us if you don't have problems. <laughs> so I've been answering Python tickets for about a year. I'm still relatively new, but I've sort of seen some general uh, patterns emerge as a result. So I want to help you, the user, avoid these. Uh, the first one is trying to install things into our base environment. The second major pain point I see is uh, related to MPI for Pi. And the third major problem is um, configuration settings in your dot files. So I will talk now about how uh, I can help you avoid these. OK, so the first problem I said was that people try to make changes to our default environment. If you remember, our default is like this prefab house. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you can't change it. The reason is because we all share this same module. So we don't want 7,000 people making changes to it. Um, so if, if you want to do something or install something that's not there, no problem. Um, you just need a custom environment. If you do forget and try to install, you'll see things like permission denied. And then that should ring a bell on your head. Oh, right, I can't um, install into the default. Um, so that's it. It's an easy solution to that problem. OK, uh, other problems we see commonly uh, are people installing MPI for Pi. So uh, in, the, uh, in the case that you're using our prefab environment, just the module load Python, we have already provided MPI for Pi. So it's there. You can use it. You don't have to worry about installing it. The confusion comes when people are using a custom environment, and then they, they find that they need to install MPI for Pi. So um, if you remember anything from this talk, please remember, do not install MPI for Pi. Just pip install or conda install it. That works on your laptop. That does not work on our very complicated supercomputer. What you need to do are to follow our directions. It's maybe just five lines of code to build MPI for Pi against our mpitch um, MPI libraries. So if you just do that and just follow our directions, uh, you should have working MPI for Pi in your con environment. Uh, just one last gotcha uh, for MPI for Pi. You will not be able to use it on our login nodes. Um, so if you're finding errors, uh, double check, make sure you're on a compute node. The other problem that I mentioned uh, is that people uh, have trouble scaling up. So this is a supercomputer. People want to run really big jobs. They have an MPI for Pi code, and uh, they find that at large scale, it starts to become really slow. 
So here's what's happening. Every library that you're importing, um, NumPy, SciPy, AstroPy, whatever your favorite library is, has to be uh, transferred to every node. And that means that there's a lot of data moving across our file systems to each of your compute nodes. Um, so <laughs> that can be slow. And now imagine that there are eight other people doing that simultaneously. So you can see how that can become a bottleneck. Um, the solution is to instead have your code in a container. So that way, the libraries that you need are there and you're not moving things across the file system. So this will make your startup fast and will also make your code resilient to anything that may or may not be happening on our file system. So uh, yeah, definitely want to consider containers. Okay, the last major family of problems uh, that Python uh, themes that come up in Python tickets are, are really not even from Python itself. They're from how you've configured your user environment. So uh, some of you may be familiar with dot files. These are like your bash RC, uh, bash profile. These files are cool because they let you um, customize your setup. They, every time you get, um, every time you have a fresh log on to Cori, they will uh, kind of set things up for you um, in an invisible way. This is good and bad because it's easy to put things in these files, um, forget about them, and then five years later, some, some setting has changed and now it's causing problems for you. So when people submit Python tickets and say, you know, uh, your Conda tool is broken, almost always the first thing we do is go in and look at your dot files. And it turns out that Conda is not broken. Um, nine times out of 10, it's just some setting that you have in your setup and maybe have forgotten about. Okay, so imagine you've uh, run into some Python problems. I log into your environment to see what you've got going on. Uh, and then I see this in your bash RC. So this is a bad example. And I show this to you um, to help you avoid this situation. So if the user has a problem with their Python environment, it becomes really, really tricky to pinpoint where the problem is coming from when you have all these settings. Um, so the best thing you can do is to try to keep these configuration files clean. Um, add only things you really need um, and periodically check to make sure your modules are up to date. Uh, these settings are things you still want. Um, in this bad example file, uh, the user had configurations from old systems that have retired at NERSC. So Edison retired last year and Hopper and Carver were, I don't know, five and 10 years ago. So um, please clean out your configuration files. It will make your life um, much easier. Okay, another question you might have about Python is, uh, should you use Python 2 or 3? And the answer is 3. Um, Python 2 officially retired at the beginning of this year. Uh, developers are no longer supporting Python 2. Uh, you will see on Cori that we do have some Python 2 environments, um, but we don't promise to keep them forever, and we are not going to put them on Perlmutter. So, if you uh, have Python 2 code, uh, now is the time to transition it to Python 3. And if uh, you're using someone else's Python 2 code, um, if you're not the developer, make sure that they have a plan uh, to convert their code to Python 3. So uh, yeah, uh, it's worth reminding them um, that's an important thing to do. Okay, and uh, what about this new system Perlmutter we're <laughs> about to have next year? It's gonna have, I think, 6,000 or more GPUs and how do you use Python on the GPUs? Um, it's a good question. So I guess as Python users, we've become a little bit spoiled in having uh, nice import statements at the top of our code that let Python do magic things. And unfortunately, there's, no, there's nothing quite like that for GPUs at the moment. Um, what I'm about to tell you uh, may be different in six months. It's, it seems to be changing pretty quickly. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you the best information that I have at the moment. Um, so there are kind of two major ways to get your Python running on a GPU. There's sort of a drop-in replacement for your standard kind of NumPy and SciPy operations. Or uh, in the case that the function you need is not yet implemented uh, in one of these, you can write your own GPU kernel, which I understand that for Python users, they may not want to do that. They may not have the expertise to do that or just may not have time. Um, so we understand there's some balance. But 
In order to fully move your code to a GPU, you may need uh, one or both of these kinds of uh, frameworks, depending on what you need. Um, I, won't, I won't talk in a lot of detail, but if you're a Pandas or a Scikit, uh, Scikit Learn user, NVIDIA has um, a framework called Rapids, where they've uh, basically implemented it for GPUs. So uh, you can check that out uh, for more information. OK, so I'll talk just really briefly about the two kinds of uh, well, the two kinds of drop-in replacements for NumPy and SciPy. Probably the easiest and um, most sophisticated one is CuPy. Uh, CuPy looks a lot like NumPy, except um, it's CUDA under the hood. Um, I don't know why people are chatting me. <laughs> Sorry, I guess you guys can see that. Okay, anyway. Um, yeah, so it's CUDA, which is good. Um, it's it will get your Python running on a GPU, but it's maybe not good because uh, it will only run on NVIDIA uh, system. So if that's a con uh, concern for you, um, if you're worried about running on different kinds of systems, um, that's an important caveat. Uh, JAX is another option. It's developed by Google, and its um, backend is XLA. So it's more portable, but it's also a little harder to use. OK, um, the other kinds of Python uh, GPU options are uh, kernel, um, custom kernel. So you can use Numba, which is a JIT compiler. This will allow you to write sort of a pseudo Python CUDA mix, uh, which will uh, result in a GPU kernel. Or uh, if you really need something more powerful than that, you can use PyCUDA or PyOpenCL. Uh, PyCUDA is basically a, an actual CUDA kernel wrapped in Python. And PyOpenCL is the same for OpenCL. So if you have GPU um, expertise in, in CUDA or OpenCL, um, this is how you can take advantage of those. OK, so just to wrap up, um, welcome to NERSC. Um, we work really hard on our Python documentation. So uh, we hope that you'll read it. We hope that it will save you some time uh, and difficulty. If you'd like to make contributions to the docs, we're happy for that too. Um, to avoid common problems in Python, uh, don't try to install into our base environment. Make your own. Um, be careful using MPI for Py, and don't put too many customizations uh, in your dot files. Um, that's all I have. So thank you very much. Okay, hi Laurie. So there is one question in the Google Doc that I'll read to you, which is, uh, it's not related to R or R Studio, which is, um, how can I use a Python IDE to connect to PERT to NERSC and write Python code? Like, can I use PyCharm? Um, I don't know. I'm actually not familiar with PyCharm. Um, uh, for IDEs, I use Spider myself, and I usually use Spider on my local laptop. Um, yeah, I don't know that we have a great way to have an IDE, but we can we can look into that and get you more information. Can I ask a question too? Oh uh, yeah. Um, do you support also PyTorch? Oh uh, yeah, we do. Um, so that's going to be covered in our last talk today. And also the Spark interface with Python. Yes, we also have Spark. So there's a, oh, a Spark page in our docs. Thanks. Okay, I don't, I don't see any other uh, Python questions in the document, uh, at least under the Python at NERSC uh, section. But if there are questions, of course, you can um, get in touch with Lori. Um, or file a ticket at help.nurse.gov.